Good afternoon. Welcome to As Seen on TV, bringing C Sharp to the living room, or an introduction to Apple TV and tvOS development and using Xamarin. My name is Matt Sokup, and before we get going, I want to tell you just a little bit about myself. I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, where I started a company called Code Mill Technology that focuses on Xamarin-based development work. Personally, I've been developing mobile.net apps since 2009, back in the mono touch and mono droid days, with my first app hitting the App Store in 2011. I'm a Xamarin MVP, and I've started a user group up in Madison that focuses on mobile development topics. And I go around to various user groups and conferences and talk about, well, Xamarin-based stuff. So I really love doing this. But that's enough about me. We have a full session here. I jam pack a lot of stuff in here. So with that said, I'm not sure how much time we have for questions today. But if you do see, I'll be hanging out after the session in the back. So if you have anything, feel free to grab me. If you see me in the hallways, grab me or send me a tweet. I'll answer, love talking about it. And I'll be posting the slides and demo code up on Twitter too as well. So let's jump into it. Apple TV and tvOS. It's not every day that we get a brand new platform to develop with, develop with. And I was all ready to go, but then I started seeing some of the screenshots that Apple released, and I was like, whoa, wait a minute here. The user controls looked different. The content that we're displaying sure, sure is different. We're not just using an iPad anymore. We're using the whole TV, and there's going to be many people in the living room using it. And the user interaction model couldn't be more different. We're not using the touch screen anymore. Instead, we are using a remote to interact with the TV. So I mean, it is completely different. However, after digging in, I found it wasn't too bad. There's a lot of the same frameworks that are still there. There's still core graphics. There's still AV kit. And UI kit still available. So it wasn't too overwhelming. But to be clear, there are some major differences that we need to take into account before we can start developing great apps for tvOS. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about those differences between tvOS and iOS, and also some unique features to tvOS that will get us up and running developing apps very quickly. So some of tonight's topics and tonight's lineup. Firstly, we're going to introduce the tvOS hardware, OS, the tvOS, and then take a tour of some of the familiar iOS controls that have made their way over to tvOS and see how they're different. Then we're going to go into some new techniques that we can use to navigate between the views in tvOS, because we're using the remote. We're not going to be using the touch screen anymore. Then finally, we're going to look at some best practices to present our content to a room full of people. So we have three new stars to introduce today. One is a familiar face who has undergone a new transition, an internal transition. The other one is a brand new star making their debut today. And finally, the other one we've seen around before, but we just can't put our finger on where we've seen them. And of course, we're talking about Apple TV, the Siri remote, and tvOS. So we're going to talk about some characteristics of each that we want to take into account before we start developing, some strengths, some weaknesses, and also some special considerations as we develop. Let's start off with the hardware. Here we're talking about the Apple TV box and also the Siri remote. The Apple TV box is a fourth generation box. And as you can imagine, with the fourth generation, it gets the obvious spec upgrades. Some things that I want to call out here that has the 64-bit A8 dual core processor with a pretty nice GPU built in, two gigabytes of RAM, and it's also game controller capable. Works with the Siri remote as well, and also the Apple TV remote. This here is the Siri remote. And we're going to talk quite a bit about it later, but we're just going to show it off right now. Touch surface at the top. Swipes, taps, clicks, various menu buttons, and a lightning connector at the bottom that you can recharge it with. Uh, talks over Bluetooth, also has IR, uh, accelerometer, and a gyroscope built in as well. So some strong points and weak points for each of these is that it has ample power for our apps. Right now, this is the bottom that we'll have for our Apple TV apps. Everything else that Apple will release is stronger. So if our app runs well on this machine, it's going to run great on future apps. And plus, although the dual core A8 processor might not be in line with the top of the line iPad, it's still pretty powerful, especially when you consider some of the games that have been released for it already. There is no hardware fragmentation right now. It's like a golden time to be developing for this. We don't have to take into account like there's an iPhone 4S that doesn't have 3D touch when we're developing like for iPhone 6. So that's, that's it's just nice. 
One screen size goes hand in hand with that. We just have 16 by nine. We don't have to worry about the small 4S and then the 6S plus and all those size classes that go with it. It's pretty sweet. Guidance from Apple says that we can rely on always on high speed internet, which means we can do HTTP live streams. We can use CloudKit. So when we're using Apple, Apple TV, developing our apps, we can always count on the high speed internet to be there. And we have a new user interaction model with the remote. We have the touch screen. We have the ability to use the gyroscope and the accelerometer. So if we're developing games, it opens up a whole new world to us for gameplay. Some of the weak points, limited storage. It's limited to 64 gigabytes on the high end, 32 gigabytes on the low end on onboard storage. 200 megabytes our app bundle is limited to. That's, that's pretty small. Four gigabytes of on-demand resources that we can download. Those are static game ad, or static assets. And we cannot write to any permanent storage. There is a temporary cache we can write to. However, that may be wiped out upon app relaunch. And we can write up to 500 kilobytes to user settings, and that will persist. Right now, there is no 4K support. So if we were going to develop apps and have high resolution graphics that you want to deliver, no dice. However, it does mean that all our assets just have to be 1x. We don't have to deliver any 2x assets. And there is a new user interaction model, strong point and weak point. We don't want to have our apps be a sore thumb and get the user lost within the app. So we want to make sure that our apps behave similar to other apps on tvOS. So if the Apple TV is the star that has undergone the internal transformation and the Siri remote's the brand new star, then tvOS must be that familiar one that we've seen around before but we can't put our finger on. And the reason is, is that tvOS is actually derived from iOS, but it's a distinct operating system, meaning that when we bundle our apps up, tvOS will not go with an iPhone or an iPad app. But there are some familiar frameworks still present. UIKit, AVKit, Core Graphics, and others, but they still, but they have tweaks made for them for TV development. It also supports a new app type, which is called TVML. And what this app type is, is TVML is a markup language. It's supported, it's, the app logic is done with JavaScript. And what Apple's done here is they've provided 18 different markup templates. And you can think of these markup templates as screens. So we have 18 different screens that we, we can play around with, and as long as we stay within those screens, we can also download these screens in run at runtime and change our app's look and feel at runtime, which is pretty cool. And they're really made for media streaming. There's a new framework called TV Services, and what this will give us is when a user puts our app on the top row of the home screen, we can take over the top half of that home screen and run essentially a mini app on the home screen allows us to personalize the content and show off our content while the app is on the home screen. And we have a radically different user interaction model. Not only are we not touching anymore using the remote, it's a social experience. We have to define our content of the app so it's broad and also immersive. People are used to watching the TV and getting lost in TV shows and getting lost in their movies. We don't want our apps to be just the big iPad that people are interacting with through a remote. We want it to be immersive and having them get lost within our apps. So with that said, we're going to take a look at some of the tvOS controls that are derived from iOS UIKit and see how they're different. And some things I want to pay particular attention to is how they are immersive and how they get out of the way of the content itself and, how they, and also how they draw the user in to use the remote to interact with them. First off is the tab bar. The tab bar itself will come down from the top and it'll pretty much make the user go back and forth, invite them to swipe back and forth to pick different tabs. As soon as they pick one, the, t the content appears, and the tab bar will slide up off the top, getting out of the user's way, and allowing them to interact with the content below. They swipe back down on the remote, and the tab bar appears again. So the tab bar is in and out and gets out of their way. This next screenshot is from the Yumly app. And you see the one is immersive. It shows this beautiful background picture of Greece. And then we have a split view controller, which takes up the entire screen. On the left-hand side is a master view controller. And we have the UI table view controller in that as well. But there's no Chrome on it. It just blends into the back. Over on the right-hand side, we see a 
the detail view controller with a collection view. And there's seamless swiping between them where it just invites the user to use the remote to go back and forth between them. And it's also intuitive where if they would click on the, on the Greek um, table view cell, you know that over on the right hand side we would see the Greek UI collection appear and if we would swipe over, we would see the Greek swipe over, we would be able to see the menu option. And then finally the page view. Again, the, you see right at the bottom there's a page, the page view indicator and you can swipe back and forth. So it's minimal, but it invites the user to swipe back and forth with the remote, but yet still immersive itself. There's also there's quite a few other UI kit controls that are available, such as the activity indicator, there's labels, there's buttons, so on and so forth. So some considerations that we want to take into account when we are thinking about tvOS apps is first that there are the two app types. There's tvML, which is the new JavaScript-based app, and also the traditional, which are UI kits. And it pretty much is the same old UI kit. It's, but there is a different way to interact, namely that we're using the remote. We want to provide an immersive experience. And most other native frameworks are still available. However, one notable exception is WebKit. WebKit is not there, which means that there's not going to be any web views. We're not going to be able to display any web pages within our apps. And most notably is that OAuth is not available. So if we're going to view any OAuth at all, we're going to have to think of a way around it. I know Twitter and Facebook have come up with uh, components that we can plug into the apps to do authentication with them. But if you're using any other providers, you're going to have to think of a way around that. So the crew behind this that makes it everything possible or the development environment, the latest and greatest for Apple is Xcode 7.3 and iOS, or tvOS 9.2 SDK. On the Xamarin side, we're moving over to the beta channel right now. It's not available in the stable channel, and it's going to be beta cycle 7, and then Xamarin Studio 6, notable for the dark theme, as we saw, in a, as we saw today. So let's take a quick look at the a quick demo just to get our bearings on what a tvOS app will look like. Fire up Xamarin Studio, do a new solution, and we'll have a tvOS sidebar now. We can select a single view, a tab view. So we'll do a single view, and you can do C sharp or F sharp. We'll evolve, and we'll create it. So the basic templates that come up, you have the app delegate, which is going to look exactly like your iOS app delegate. There's also a view controller, which, no surprise, looks just like an iOS view controller. And by default, it is a storyboard-based app. The storyboard does have one difference, and when it does come up, we'll see it. You can also do this off of zip files, or if you wanted to do all in code, you can as well. I find using the storyboards most intuitive just to see everything at once. And the big difference between the storyboards from a tvOS and an iOS app is that the storyboard is quite a bit larger. So let's just create a quick user interface. We'll drag two buttons to the screen. As we can see, there's really not much difference or no difference here as when we're creating an iOS app. We'll zoom in to create give our control some constraints so we can keep it where we need it. And then we will bump up the font size so we can see it. Again, everything's the same as we have been doing in iOS. Give it a label and we'll do the same thing over on the, with the buttons. Zoom back out, and that's our UI for our first TV app. So if we want to add an action or an event behind the scenes, all it is, again, is clicking the events over on the Properties pad and then add, adding the action. Brings us over into the view controller behind and adding it. So let's take a quick look at the designer. And as you would imagine, it's just full of outlets and actions, as you would have in if you're doing it through Xcode itself. So again, no surprises at all. 
we'll implement it. And then we'll run it. And it'll bring up the simulator. And one thing I notice here is you click on it and nothing happens. And I'm a little bit embarrassed to say, I'll make it a little bit smaller, that it took me a while to figure out why nothing was happening here. And it's because the remote wasn't being shown. So you actually need the remote to, act, to interact with it. So you get the remote shown, and then we can do our work. You can also use the keyboard to navigate back and forth and use the keyboard to do that as well, to interact with it. So that's the basic structure of a tvOS app. It's not much different than an iOS app at all, except your storyboards are, are larger. So we'll jump back out to here. So now that we have a general feel for the tvOS differences between iOS and what the t tvOS offers us, let's take a look at one of the major, major differences between tvOS and iOS. And that's how we allow the user to interact with with the operating system through the remote. And that'll lead us into something that Apple calls the focus model. So we're gonna inter investigate the types of interactions that the user can have with the remote control, handling the events that gets fired, then navigate between the views that, on, that are on the screen, and then some design considerations that we need to take into account. That leads into the focus model, so we'll define what that is, how the focus engine implements the focus model, and then how our code can interact with it. And then finally, we'll end that up with a demo. So we can't talk about interacting with tvOS without taking a look at the CRU remote. So all interaction, obviously, with tvOS is gonna happen across the room. And the way we do that is, unlike in iOS, in tvOS, there's when only one element on a screen can be interacted with at any given time. In iOS, you can tap anywhere on a screen and have any element be interacted with. tvOS is the opposite way. Only one element can be interactive with, and that element is called being in focus. The Siri remote is the way we manipulate that in focus element. Certain game controllers can do it as well. The Siri remote can be used in landscape mode, and it also has an accelerometer and a gyroscope are available as well. So back to this screenshot with these six event emitters, as I call them. Out of these six, the home, the volume, and the Siri search button are not available for our use. They're system reserved. That leaves us with the touch surface, the menu, and the play pause. The touch surface allows gestures, but only one finger only swipes. No pinch to zooms. Taps, lightly tapping on the, on the touch surface, and then full on clicks, where you click down and actually get the tactile sensation. The menu button is always gonna be a back button in our navigation hierarchy. Or if you're developing a game, it's gonna be a pause button and bring up the pause screen. And then finally, the play pause button. Generally, that's gonna be a playback shortcut if you're displaying media. Or if you're doing a game, it's gonna be the game controls, such as fire or jump. So let's take a look at some of the events or how we would handle the events that the remote would throw. For a touchpad click, it's gonna look a lot like a touch up inside event where we just handle the on a button, a primary action triggered, and then we just do something with it. You can do the same thing as we saw through the storyboard or through Interface Builder, but this would all be just in C-sharp. One thing to note, though, is that there are no touch events in tvOS. Instead, we have something that right here is called the primary action triggered, and there are what are called UI press objects. So if we get down to the low-level tracking, we would have presses began, presses changed, and presses ended, instead of touches began, touches changed, touches ended. To handle a swipe recognizer on the touch surface, first off is a UI swipe gesture recognizer. Then we can pass in the action that we want to have happen to it. Next up is we do the direction that we want to have. So this one would just be up. And then finally add it to the view that we want to have listened to. Then a remote button click. It's a tap gesture recognizer. Here we allow, we say what we want the allowed press types to be. And so you'll notice that there's a UI press type enumeration that we pass to it in, a, in an array. So play, pause, menu, or any of the d-directional buttons on the, touch, on the touch surface, such as up, down, left, or right, can be passed to it. And then again, you're just adding it to the view that you want to have listen to it. 
So this is all pretty similar from what you would expect from iOS development. There really isn't anything new here. But what is new is the way that we implement it. And that leads to some remote best practices. The one thing we always, always want to do is to not repurpose standard gestures. So if you think of a button, you don't want to take the click button, the click event, which normally would fire the action and move us along in, say, a navigation hierarchy, and make the touch event do the same thing. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and you'll eventually end up confusing your user. We don't want to invent new gestures. So same example, then fire a button click event, you don't want to have the user have to make a circle using the, using the gyroscope. It doesn't make sense, and it makes our app hard to use, so they won't be using it as much. And we always, always, always want to use the menu as a back button. The only exception is if you're developing a game and then it's a pause button. Which leaves us a navigation. Navigating between views on the screen and also between pages. The golden rule here is that everything needs to be obvious. We're starting with there's only one item in focus at any given time. The focused item needs to be obvious. It needs to stand out from the background. Movement between items needs to happen with minimal gestures. And so for this, imagine that you have a grid of items on a screen. Each one could get focus. And you want to go from the upper left-hand item, which has focus, down one row. You don't want to have to go all the way down a row, then down, and then go all the way back in order to get that one item focused. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and you're going to end up frustrating your users. Instead, you want to just be able to go down one. Same thing with screens. The navigation between them needs to be intuitive. So what we're talking about here, you want to have a single point of entry into any given screen. You don't want to have two ways in to a screen, because if the user gets to it from two different ways and hits the back button or the menu button and doesn't remember how they got there, they might get disoriented as to how they got got there and wondering why they're back at this one screen when they expected the other one. So there's a learning curve for the user to learn tvOS, and we don't want to confuse them. Which leads to the last point, don't get the user lost. We want to be very explicit on how to use tvOS, so we don't want, or how they interact with our apps in tvOS, so we don't want to get the user lost ever. So let's take a look at this screenshot and see how, this is from the Apple App Store, and see how they implemented very obvious and intuitive user interaction. We're going to start, the, the control that's in focus is in bright white, and we can see that's the preview button. And we can be reasonably assured that if we would click on that, we would see a preview of this app. If we would swipe right on that preview button, the 299 button will come into focus. It would be bright white, and we can be reasonably assured that if we would click on that, we'd be given the opportunity to buy this app. Preview button's in focus, and we would swipe down. We can be assured that Jupiter would come into focus, the screenshot below, and we click on that, that would come in be full screen. This is all great. It works as you would expect, and it's intuitive, and you know what's in focus and how to interact with it. But how do we, as, we as developers, control that? Do we have to enter a swipe right gesture recognizer on the preview button to set the focus over the 299 button, and then a down gesture recognizer to give Jupiter focus? And then the 299 button kind of sits between Jupiter and the sun. So if we do a swipe down gesture recognizer, which one of those two gets focus? I mean, so all of a sudden, we're doing a bunch of different focus swipes. And what happens if there's a new control that goes between Jupiter and the sun? And then we have to rewrite all our gesture recognizers to make sure that what gets focus is proper. And it becomes worse than doing auto layout. It's how do we handle that? Lucky, luckily for us, that Apple has introduced something called the focus engine. And the focus engine is the implementation of the focus model for UI kit controls. The focus model being everything we've talked about up until this point. It's a theory of indirect UI manipulation, namely, only one view is in focus at any given time, and obvious and intuitive movement between views. The focus engine is intended to use with the Siri remote, although it does work with others, and it provides a consistent user experience across tvOS. Again, not to get the user lost across any of the apps within tvOS. So now some API basics with the Focus Engine. It is responsible for maintaining a single view and focus at one time. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't make two views have focus at once. Would, wouldn't be possible. 
It also takes care of finding the next focusable view for us, and it's gonna do so in the way of, that's most obvious. So in the, in the case of before, when we had the 299 button highlighted and we would swipe down, it would make the leftmost view focusable. There are ways we can override it and give it suggestions of what it should make focusable, but by default, it's gonna make the most obvious one focusable. It's also gonna do things such as handle momentum swipes. So if we have a bunch of views lined up in a row and we swipe right hard, it's gonna skip several ones and set several ones in a row and go towards the end. Same thing if we had one focusable view partially obscuring another one, the one that's obscured isn't gonna get focused. So it's gonna handle all these weird edge cases for us that we don't have to worry about. We cannot set focus programmatically. There is no dot set focus. We can do things to request focus. We can say, hey, I want a focus update, but we cannot explicitly set focus anywhere. And the reason for that is we, we don't want focus to go from the upper left to the lower right automatically without the user actually doing something to trigger that. The focus engine also provides an API to respond to focus changes. So in this case, there is a event that gets fired that says, here's the last focus view, and here's the next focus view, and then we can have the opportunity to apply animations to it to draw the user's attention to, hey, this view's going out of focus, and this one's coming in focus, just to provide a better user experience and to draw people's attention to what's coming, going on. And the last point is that we don't want to fight the focus engine. The defaults on most UI kit controls are gonna work right away out of the box. So we don't need to fight them. We can do things to enhance them, but we shouldn't be swimming upstream against them. So that's gonna lead us into our second demo here. We're gonna show off some of the API that the focus, that the focus engine gives us. and how we can use it towards our advantage. So first, I wanna run this app. And I have to warn everybody here that this app, I'm from Wisconsin, and one of the unwritten rules of living in Wisconsin is that we have to think about cheese at least 22 hours a day, so I have to get my quota in. And so this app is probably the first and only app ever, and will be ever, to be written up for finding and learning more about artisanal cheeses. So here we can bring in and we can read about the cheese. We can see a video of making of it, view any wine pairings, and then view more about the dairy that made it. And then finally, we can give it, if we like it, the wedge of approval. But unfortunately, we cannot get that wedge of approval highlighted. We can't bring the focus down there. And the reason for that is, is that it's an image view. And by default, Im image views cannot get focus because they're images and you're gonna have images all over the place and by default you don't want images getting focus. So let's change that, let's get that image to have focus. So what we wanna do, we're gonna add a new class, call it focus image. I already have a snippet made for it. And what we're doing here, we're just registering it so the runtime can see this UI image view that we inherited from. And the constructor that gets invoked from the storyboard, we call this initialize display function. The same as we would do in iOS, we're saying, hey, this image view can interact with the user. And this next part's new. We're saying adjust image when the ancestor gets focus. So when the image view actually gets a focus, tvOS is gonna adjust the image for us to make it obvious that the image view has focus. And then finally, we're gonna override this can become focused method and just return true saying, hey, focus engine, stop on this image view because it can get focus. So then the next thing that we have to do is actually go onto the storyboard and change what the class is for that image view. clean the solution and we'll run it again.
bring it up, and now we can see that we're able to stamp it with the wedge of approval. And one other thing that TBOS gives us then is that we're able to move it around, and we see we have a little parallax effect going in the background, so it really says, hey, that we've, you have focus and we're able to interact with it, and it, comes, it kind of comes out in 3D as well. So another thing I want to call out real quick is, in the detail view controller here, we have this did update focus method that we're overriding. It receives a UI focus update context, and what that has is the next focus view coming in, into account, and then the previous focus view as well, which we're not looking at. So if we look in here, you'll notice one thing, is that the labels below the buttons are also turning white when the, when the buttons get focused. So all we're doing is first initializing all the labels to black, and then we're checking to see if the next focus view is equal to any given button, and then turning its corresponding label color to white. So it just gives a little extra animation or a little extra visual oomph to what we're, what's going on on screen. So we're going with the focus engine and giving, it, and giving our UI just a little extra pizzazz. All right, so to recap on scene one, that we, all user interaction is gonna be happening at a distance, no more touch screens. So we have to maintain a consistent remote control experience across our, not only our app, but across TVO, TVOS, because we don't wanna get the user loss, and we wanna give them easy navigation. And we need to take time to understand the focus model and the focus engine as well. So not fight against it, but so we can give our app just a little bit better. So now that we understand how to interact with the remote and also how to use the focus model, let's take some time to understand how to present content to a room full of people because it's not going to be one person using the app anymore. So we're going to look at some design practices to provide a cinematic experience for many people far away and also how to best do organized and legible content and some tools to provide it, including stack views, and collection views. So first off is that we have immersive content. Apple is billing Apple TV as personalizing TV for your interests, whether it's lifestyle or games or shopping. But, but it's not just personal. Apple TV is also going to be social. There's going to be many people in the living room sharing the TV experience for you. So our challenge as developers is to make the content so everybody gets lost in it, not just one person. So some ways that we can do it are providing what I'm calling cinematic content. And that's going to be edge-to-edge -edge content. We want to provide beautiful photos in the background, beautiful pictures, and not have all our content shoved up in one corner of the screen. Rather, we want to have it spread up across the screen. No chrome in between the controls. We want all the controls to fade together across the screen. The only thing that we want to really have stand out is what's in focus at any given time. So you want to let the contents, content stand out, but not exactly what our controls are. And that also helps the, helps the remote control experience as well by inviting the user to remo user remote to move between them, where there's no hard delineations. And then, obviously, rely on the focus model. So where this helps is that when you have other people in the room and they're not holding the remote, they're passive observers, they still, because the focus model is intuitive, they still know what's going on with the app, and that they can, in, they can anticipate what's going to happen next. And then organized content. We want to make sure it's legible at a distance, which means not to pack too much on a screen at any given time. It also means that we want to adjust for content appearing and disappearing. So if we have three columns of content, and the one on the left-hand side disappears, we want to make sure our other two fill in the screen so we just don't leave a big empty space. And then reduce the words on the screen when possible. We don't want to have people having to squint to read. We want the content to come to them instead of them trying to pull the content from the screen. So there's a couple different tools that we can use that help us out greatly with this. The first being the stack view. So first off, we can look at the, we have the image of Matt Damon behind us as an astronaut, looking tough. And then we have four buttons along with their labels on the bottom. And to keep those buttons organized with their labels, they're put, all put in a vertical stack view. And they keep all those aligned. We have those in a horizontal stack view. 
So if we had to add a new button along this, along this row, all we have to do is add a new vertical stack view. That horizontal stack view would take care of it for us, or popping it in right away. Or if we had to remove the 599 rent button, it would be no problem at all. The content would adjust and fill in. Same thing for the ratings across the top. All those labels are put into a vertical or horizontal stack view. Then that entire section then is a vertical stack view. And then if we, had to, if we would increase the amount of text and or take the text out altogether, we can adjust the, the content and the view. The director and the star information, another vertical stack view. And the whole thing is wrapped in a horizontal stack view. So these stack views are really helping us out. And then we don't have to do a whole bunch of auto layout constraints at all. It's great for adjusting for the content appearing and disappearing automatically. Collection views. We're going to see grid layouts all over the place in tvOS. They're a great way to display a lot of data easily. And they still follow the same old collection view paradigms that we're used to from iOS with a data, data source and delegate pattern. We are able to obviously customize the, the, the view itself. We have the supplemental views we can provide. And the layouts are actually are changeable at runtime as well. And the focus engine actually takes care of the scrolling for us. So at here, if we would scroll down on the touch surface, the focus model would scroll up. This is also a collection view. And again, it's obvious to tell which view is in focus. It's the one in the upper left with the label. But it's a little more artistic on the layout design. Again, organizing all the content in a way that's easy to understand. So what we want to do is we want to provide a living room experience. We want to bring all the people, even the passive observer of our apps who's not holding a remote, and bring them into the app itself. We want to have immersive, edge-to-edge -edge content, and no Chrome if we can help it in between our controls. Easy to read content and easy to understand it from a distance. And we want to, in order to help do that, we want to adjust for content appearing and disappearing. Two tools that'll help us do that are the stack view, auto layouts, little helper as I call it, and collection views, which are grid organizations. So to sum up in our closing credits here, that we have a new generation of hardware and a new remote. TVOS gives us two new ways to write apps, the TVML and also the traditional, which generally is going to be UI kit based unless you're doing apps. The user will not interact directly, so we're going to have to rely on the focus model. We want to make interactions with it as obvious and intuitive as we possibly can. And we want to have immersive and organized layouts. So again, my name is Matt Sokup. Thank you for everybody coming out. I really appreciate it.